I ask you to open your Bibles to the letter to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you don't know yet, um, Harvest USA is a ministry that uh, seeks to disciple people, particularly targeting patterns of sexual sin. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do in the few minutes that I have with you this morning is to invite you or plead with you uh, to a paradigm shift in the way you think about sexuality, the way you engage the world with sexuality, the way you engage the people in your congregations, either now or in the future, or those that you are in ministry with. Um, so follow along as I read. Now, what versions do you have? Do you have... ESV. ESV, good. That's what I'll be reading from. Beginning at verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I'm asking for a paradigm shift. I'm asking us to shift from just a typical tit-for-tat argument stance or a, you know, offering mitigating considerations type of conversation to the type of conversation that turns everything on its head. So growing up, uh, my family would often have discussions. And I can imagine, for instance, a discussion very like this. I couldn't remember. It's usually something trivial like what ice cream are we going to have. But let's say we're discussing where we're going to go <coughs> for a vacation. And I had three brothers and sisters, and um, it would go something like this. One of us would want to go to the mountains. I want to go to the mountains. The other one, I want to go to the beach. Well, the beach, the beach is fine, but it's boring. There's nothing to do there. And the other person, well, the mountains are great and exciting. There's a lot to do, but it's exhausting in the mountains, and I want to relax on my vacation. Those kinds of back and forth discussions would then usually with a playful finality, be met with my father saying, well, this family is not a democracy, it's a monarchy, and I say we're going camping. <laughs> Everything would get turned on its head. That's something what we see here in the beginning of this passage. Paul begins with these statements, this, this tit-for-tat conversation. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Now, you need to hear, first of, all, first of all, that this whole passage is about sexuality. This is where he's going with all this. These are maxims and sayings and, and considerations that ultimately are all being used in reference to sexuality. All things are lawful, but... Not all things are helpful. You can imagine how those things go. But then he gets to, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. Now, wherever in your Bible they put the quotations or they connect things, I want to suggest to you that this is the unit. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. Because that whole section is completely parallel to the next section. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will raise us up by his power. So food for the stomach and the stomach for food. The body not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. God will destroy both one and the other. God is going to raise you up, not destroy you. It's that parallel. And the, the shift that he's asking us to make 
is from the typical appetitive view of sexuality to a theological view of sexuality. Paul is saying the, the fundamental, the most important direction from which to, to face and discuss and live sexuality is not biological, it's not appetitive, it's not emotional, it's not cultural, it's theological. And it's theological specifically in this way as he develops. It's theological because it is a picture of the gospel as described in union with Christ. Now, he makes reference to this phrase, for the two will become one flesh. And he's, he's clearly applying it to sexuality in a wrong way with a prostitute. Now, in referencing the two shall become one flesh, he's, he's quoting from Genesis 2, when, it was, when marriage was instituted, when sexuality, human sexuality was instituted, this phrase, the two shall become one flesh, uh, appears again uh, when Jesus is asked about divorce. And he says, what God has joined together, let not man separate, because it is written, the two shall become one flesh. And it is also uh, used by Paul again in Ephesians. Now, I want to... What I want to do is briefly explore a few ways, specific ways, that the gospel as union with Christ is pictured by sexuality the way it is envisioned, the way it is created by God. And I'm going to use especially the Ephesians passage and this passage in 1 Corinthians. I would say they're very parallel 1 Corinthians deals more with how sexual immorality undercuts and negates the gospel picture. And Ephesians is much more of a positive picture to, to husbands on how their love for their wife should picture the gospel. And I want you to understand that this includes sexuality. When the two shall become one flesh phrase is used, it, as we're used to saying, it, it, it encompasses the whole relationship of marriage, but it doesn't do so any less of sexuality itself because the phrase literally has reference to a fleshly union and by extension to the whole relationship. Sexuality has its whole meaning and purpose tied into that marriage relationship and doesn't mean anything outside of that. You cannot separate the two. And so whatever we say about the marriage relationship is the necessary context and gives meaning to sexuality. So what is that? What are, what are some of those ways that sexuality in particular mirrors or images or pictures the gospel? First of all, it's anchored eschatologically. And I normally don't use that descriptor for this point, but I'm in a seminary. So I can say that. I usually say something like it's, it's tied to the future. It's anchored in the future. In our passage here, and God raised the Lord and will raise us up also. We are united not just to a crucified Christ. We are united to a risen Christ. So that when we are in him, the resurrection is guaranteed to us. Our identity is in him. We have been crucified with him. We have been raised with him. We are now dead and our life, our true identity is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ appears, we will be made like him. That makes a tremendous difference in the gospel, does it not? That makes a tremendous difference. This gives patience. It gives endurance. It gives security, peace, hope. Why? Why? Because in our Christian life, we have many ups and downs. We have many times when we doubt, when we doubt our faith, when we've fallen, when we're discouraged by a sin that we can't seem to conquer. And how important is it for us to know that if we are in Christ, we are united to his resurrection, and that is ours as well. It is incredibly important. Also, this eschatological anchor guides our daily Christian life. It motivates and shapes our sanctification. I'm thinking of, like I quoted Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Because you are raised with Christ, set your mind on things above where Christ is. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you. The first thing that's listed, by the way, is sexual immorality. 
In 1 John 3, which I also briefly quoted, when we see him, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And those who have this hope purify themselves as he is pure. That anchor guides us. I want you to think of a mountain climber. Mountain climbers are usually uh, attached to a rope, a, a belay that is anchored high up on the mountain, all the way to the top usually at some point. And it's there because when they have the inevitable slips and falls, it won't kill them. It gives them peace and security. They can keep moving up. Now, there is another way to climb mountains. You may be aware it's called free soloing. Free soloing is you go without the ropes and you just climb. In my, uh, in my study of that, the article that I read described two of the greatest mountain climbers ever that pioneered free soloing. And the last sentence of that article said, both of them died young from impact. So there you have it. It makes a difference for the gospel, being anchored to the top of that mountain. But it also makes a difference for marriage sexuality, does it not? Marriage in its time and realm, it's only for this life, it's not eternal, but in this realm, marriage also is anchored to as far as you can go, till death do we part. As, go, as Jesus says, let not man separate what God has put together. It's permanent, and that makes a difference for sexuality. It makes a tremendous difference. Why? Well, there's slips and falls. We have bad days. Sex in marriage is relational, and that means you're relating to a person and you have arguments, and you're not always on the same page. Sometimes you embarrass each other, you anger each other, you hurt each other. What you think is going to be a wonderful date night ends in tears or grit teeth. In many ways, pornography is an attempt to escape that, right? Pornography is to say, okay, I'm going to escape all of that risk and go into a fantasy land. I'm going to free solo. Pornography ends in death because it's not the real thing. It's a counterfeit escape from the risk of relationship. God's answer is to anchor sexuality in a permanent life commitment so that what you get is safety, security, peace, and a joy that free soloing in sexuality can never give you, which is the cumulative joys of a long-term relationship. To know that sex in marriage is not a one-night stand. It's not a one-time event. It's a lifelong adventure. It's going to have ups and downs. But you are building a bond of love and commitment that grows and grows. That applies not just to your relationship, but to your sexuality. Also... The end shapes and guides the day-to-day. -day. I want to challenge you. Um, do you love your wife or your husband sexually because of the youthful look of her body or his body, his current strength? What does that say then when you grow old? I would challenge you that for your sexuality to be guided by the eschatological anchor, you would have to say, I love you right now, not because of the way you look to me now or what you're able to do for me now, but I love you now and I will love you no less, but in fact more when you are old and wrinkled and saggy and gray. That kind of love is a love that powers true biblical marriage sexuality. It changes the moment. So eschatologically anchored. Second point, it is exclusive. This is the principle of holiness. Now, there's lots of ways to define and talk about holiness, but I wanna, I wanna emphasize holiness as making distinctions to set apart something as belonging. So think of Leviticus. All the times that God is making distinctions, you know, don't make cloth, don't make, don't make cloth out of two kinds of thread and don't plant two kinds of, why? Because there needs to be a distinction between you and the other nations. I'm going to make distinctions so that everybody else knows and so that you know that you are devoted to me, God is saying. You are mine. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. You belong to me. I make distinctions. 
In our passage here, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are not your own. You've been set apart for him. In Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, that he might sanctify her, that she might be holy and without blemish, that he might set her apart to belong to him. What a comfort this is in regard to the gospel. I grew up reciting, what is my only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. This is precious. On what basis does he do this? On what basis does he give this holiness of belonging? Well, you may learn at some point in your doctrine class, when you study justification, the two categories, analytic or synthetic. Analytic justification is that God would analyze you. He would look at you and say, is there something there which I can look at and say, that's righteous, that's holy. I'm going to, on that basis, set this person uh, apart from me. Synthetic is he is going to add to you what is not there. Well, here's the answer. Is justification analytic or synthetic? It is analytic with respect to Christ. And therefore, as you are in him, it is synthetic with respect to you. In other words, this setting apart as holy has no basis in you. It's God's decision. He confers it on you. Again, what a comfort all of that is. Now, what about sexuality? When Paul says that the husband needs to treat his wife this way, I believe what he's saying is you need to make distinctions with regard to your wife. And the same could be said to a wife in regard to her husband, but especially here speaking to the husband. Make distinctions. There are ways that you talk to your wife that you should not talk to other women. There are ways you look at your wife that you should not look at other women. Women. There are things you do, places you go, conversations you have, etc. I'm not going to make the rules for you specifically, but they need to be there. There's a couple examples in scripture where this where this can be seen. David failed to do this when he saw Bathsheba and sent for his servants and said, who is this woman? And they said, isn't that the wife of Uriah and the son of, was it Eliam or some, I don't remember the name, but the son of somebody. Someone's wife, someone's daughter. What are you doing, David? And David disregarded those distinctions. Boaz, on the other hand, when he saw Ruth, before he determined how he would relate to her and even think about her, he asked, whose young woman is that? Whose? What are the distinctions? Who's, what are the relationships here? What distinctions can I make or not make? Is she a potential wife or is she not? Do you make distinctions for your wife? And does your wife have to earn this distinction? Or do you confer it? Do you realize the effect that pornography has on a wife? All of this is obliterated. All of this preciousness of not having to earn the distinction of belonging to someone is obliterated and suddenly she has to compete with everyone else. It is an anti-gospel picture. The third, the third category is loving. For you were bought with a price, our passage says. You were bought with a price. In the gospel, does it move you what it cost Jesus to accomplish this union? Does it move you to know that he had to be forsaken by the Father's love for you? He willingly suffered in order to purchase this union. And so in sex, I would ask you, in your relationship with your wife, is it easy or is it costly? Is it easy or is it costly? Sexual immorality is always offering you the easy. But sex in marriage is not easy because it's loving. Friends, the gospel in these ways, and this is just evocative, there's many, many other ways that we could explore that sexuality mirrors union with Christ. But in these ways, how have we done? I think we've probably failed in many ways, even though we've kept the rules, perhaps. When Paul says, 
Flee sexual immorality, for every other sin is outside the body, but this sin is against your own body. I think what he's saying here, I've always wondered about that, have you? I think what he's saying is, what I'm describing here is how, in specific, your body in sexuality is supposed to be a picture of the gospel. And if you use it for sexual immorality, you turn your own body into an anti-gospel picture. An anti-gospel. And to the extent that you use your body in that way, you hinder your ability to understand the gospel. That is, that is something to be fled from. But the gospel also is not ultimately from us to God. It's from God to us. And so our comfort is that we are not completely hampered by our broken sexuality and the sins of our past. Because as we learn to appreciate all of the aspects of union with Christ, the benefits of that, we can let that transform and shape our sexuality. That is, in fact, what Paul was expecting in Ephesians 5 and in 1 Corinthians, that these gospel truths would be shaping our sexuality. That, friends, is what needs to shape us. That's what we need to be engaging the world with, and that's what we need to be telling our congregations. Would you pray with me a moment? Lord, please give effective to, effectiveness to this word. Make it alive in us. Thank you so much for our union with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close with uh, 25A.